I thought I knew her. But in the darkness of that room, every text message cut deeper like a blade to my heart. She sat with him in that cafe's shadowed corner, their hands brushing as if they could hide their betrayal. When I confronted her, wedding photos torn at our feet, the truth exploded like a fury inside me. Alone, I penned my revenge, determined to reclaim everything I lost, and standing over his grave, I smirked, knowing this was only the beginning. It was a long journey from Singapore to O'Hare International, about 20 hours with a stop in Taipei. I was in business class, which felt only slightly nicer than economy. Flying back to Chicago on my birthday didn't really bother me much. I had a tough meeting ahead with the head of our international stock and share trading department, but that wasn't what weighed heavily on my mind. I was more concerned about what awaited me at home. We landed just after 8.30 in the morning. I took the shuttle to the Sheraton Suites in Chicago, where I had booked a room for the night before, so it was ready for me. I quickly dropped my bags, took a shower, and headed to the gym. I worked out with weights for 30 minutes and then ran on the treadmill for another 30. After that, I took another shower, enjoying the warm water for almost 15 minutes. To wake myself up, I turned on a brief burst of cold water until I felt a chill. April in Chicago is not warm but I managed it until my teeth started chattering. Then I switched back to hot water for five minutes, which helped wake me up. I went down to the restaurant for a classic American breakfast, something I had missed during my months away. I enjoyed pancakes, eggs, bacon, and sausage, all covered in maple syrup while sipping four cups of coffee. After that, I made my way to J.P. Morgan on Dearborn Ave for my 10.30 meeting. I took the elevator to the eighth floor where the private bank suites were located. After showing my ID in the foyer, I was led to a small conference room to wait. There were two cameras in the room, and I was sure they were watching me. I placed my laptop bag on the table and stood by the window, gazing out without moving. I waited there for over 17 minutes, and I noticed the time as I counted. I stood still having learned from my travels in the Far East to always stay calm and show no weakness. Joe Rutledge, the vice president of international stock and commodities trading, entered, followed closely by our corporate lawyer, Samuel Young. If it had been just Joe, we would have been brainstorming solutions. If it had been just Samuel, we would have been discussing legal matters. But with both of them there, it was clear that things were serious, and I was the one in trouble. Adam. There was no handshake, just a motion for me to sit while they took their seats across from me. The tension in the room was thick. What happened in Singapore? It wasn't really a question. We asked you to help the team, and instead you approved a $300 million investment in a new company on the Singapore Stock Exchange that has no history beyond what they say is a great idea. Yes. Yes what? Yes, I did. His face became noticeably red, showing his frustration. Can you explain? Look, Joe, it's all in my report. The CA prospectus was very detailed. They explained everything clearly. The management team is experienced with nearly 200 years of combined work. The project is set to last 50 years, and the numbers were verified by Deloitte and KPMG. I paused for a moment. With fish stocks decreasing, their aquaculture project is advanced and backed by real experience. Then why is their stock price going down? He asked sharply. They started at $17 a share and now they're at $9.55. He pointed at the numbers on the table. And what did you do? You bought more? Yes, because I believe it will come back. If it rises to 25 as my team and I expect, we will have shares valued at both 17 and 9.55 which could lead to a profit of $267 million. That's almost a 90% profit. He didn't seem to understand the full perspective. Joe, we own 25% of this company. We are the largest shareholder of a company that's losing value, he said, clearly upset. That's due to short selling from Chinese markets and, to a lesser extent, Thai and Vietnamese markets. They see this company as competition and are trying to hurt it. They aim to bring down the price so they can buy in cheap or push it out of the international fish trade. I placed my hand on the table for emphasis. We need to be careful and hold our position. This is a big mistake, he shook his head. 
These aren't the unstable times of the past. We need to rely on solid facts and keep a good risk balance. It's all in my report, I repeated. Your report doesn't provide enough support, he shot back. Regardless, this isn't just my choice anymore. The board supports my recommendation and you're out. After that, it was Samuel's job to tell me the next steps. The offer included three months of pay and nearly 30 days of leave, meaning I'd receive a total of five months' pay. They would also buy back my share options and pay the difference between the original price and the current price. I would leave with close to $800,000, but with my reputation damaged and few job prospects ahead. By two o'clock, I had signed all the necessary papers, transferred my retirement savings to a new account, and returned all my company belongings, including my laptop. I was led outside, standing on the sidewalk with an empty bag over my shoulder and a strange feeling in my head. I quickly grabbed a cab to take me back to the hotel, my thoughts racing with worry. Once in my room, I poured a small drink from the bar and mixed it with soda over ice. I sat down to think about my choices. At 42, I was too young to stop working. But could I start fresh? After some thought, I realized there was one option that felt risky, but it was time to move ahead. So I decided to go buy a new laptop with the latest software. I downloaded the programs I needed to manage my investments and got to work. I plugged in a USB drive with my important trades, ready to begin. I checked our savings account. It had $50,000. My investment accounts had $250,000, but I needed to give a day's notice to access them. I decided to sell some shares I owned, hoping that with my salary and shares I'd reach over a million. This money would clear in two days, and I aimed to transfer most of it to an international trading account. By the time I finished, it was after nine. I ordered dinner through room service and took out my phone. It had been off for more than 36 hours, a record for me. I thought about turning it on, but felt too tired to deal with whatever messages awaited me. So I set it aside and lay on the bed, flipping through the news channels. Unfortunately, nothing caught my eye. After a while, exhaustion took over, and I fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up early, still adjusting to the time difference, and went down for breakfast. I grabbed some coffee and turned on my phone, which immediately filled with messages. Help Dad! Mom's upset! That was from Dean and Katie. There was more, but that was the main part. What's happening with Jean? asked my dad. Happy birthday! Why aren't you answering your phone? wrote Jean's parents. Happy birthday, Dad, said Dean and Katie. Happy birthday and good luck, Adam, wished the Singapore team. Happy birthday, son, said my dad. Happy birthday, little brother added my sister Georgia. Then came more messages from Dean, saying that mom was feeling down but had calmed a bit. There were no messages from Jean. No birthday wishes or explanations about why everyone thought she was acting strangely. It felt like I didn't matter. I caught the 8.30 flight to Springfield, took an Uber home, and walked into a mess. The kids had left their games, soda cans, and plates all over the living room. The floors looked like they hadn't been cleaned in a while. The kitchen was even worse, with the sink full of dirty dishes and the dishwasher packed. The dustbin was full. I went to the laundry room with my clothes, and it looked like there were weeks' worth of dirty laundry. I sorted the whites and lights from the darks and started washing them. Back upstairs, I began cleaning, starting in the living room and then moving to the kitchen. The formal lounge had two empty bottles and glasses that still had some lipstick marks on them. Our bedroom needed attention, too. I put on fresh sheets, changed the duvet cover, and opened the window to let in some air. The kids' rooms were actually cleaner, messy, but not too chaotic. As I cleaned, I picked up toys, put things away, and finished up. I vacuumed the floors and emptied the bins. After almost three hours of work, things finally looked better. Then I went to my study to start my laptop. The first thing I did was check the Southeast Asia, Aquaculture CA stock. It had dropped to $9.37, almost two points down in just one day. I planned to see what I could do once my money cleared and I could trade. I called my dad. It had been five years since mom had passed away. We talked about Jean. He told me that Jean seemed sad and distant for the past couple of weeks, feeling down for no clear reason. That was strange. I checked our bank statements, but everything looked normal. It was becoming more puzzling. I went through the messages on our home phone, but there was nothing unusual there either. After folding clothes for a bit, I decided to see what I could make for dinner.
The answer was, not much. I went to the garage and reconnected the battery to my Audi. It started right up. I drove to the local supermarket to buy some basics and picked up ingredients for a Thai green curry and jasmine rice. I cooked the rice in water and coconut milk with a piece of ginger for extra flavor. I cooked chicken strips with baby zucchini, baby eggplant, crushed lemongrass, minced garlic, lots of basil and fresh cilantro, adding green chilies. I poured in a can and a half of coconut milk, two tablespoons of curry paste, and the zest and juice of two limes. I added a spoonful of fish sauce and a teaspoon of sugar to balance everything out, letting it simmer. I chopped spring onions along with fresh cilantro and basil to sprinkle on top once I served the meal. I set the table and poured myself a beer. I was halfway through my drink when Jean's car pulled up outside and the kids rushed in, fully excited to see me and my car in the driveway. I hugged them both tightly, telling them how much I missed them even though we always had our video calls. I felt tears in my eyes as Katie hugged me, clearly emotional. Dean stayed calm, showing his growing up demeanor. We held that hug for a while. When I looked up, I saw Jean watching us with a sad look on her face and tears rolled down her cheek. She waited for me to stand up with our kids holding on to me. Then she stepped closer and gave me a soft kiss. Welcome home, Adam. Her voice sounded flat and her body language showed she was upset. She glanced away from me before mentioning the smell of the food. Mmm, that smells nice. What is it? It's a Thai green curry, I replied. Dean and Katie looked at me with curiosity. I don't know what that is, Dad, but it smells great, Dean said, smiling as Katie hugged me tightly, her feet swinging in the air. You two go wash up and get ready for dinner, Jean told them. Hurry now, you can spend lots of time with your dad afterward. She came in and gave me a warm hug and a quick touch on the cheek. You look tired, Adam. She looked me over. Why are you back so soon? I thought you would be gone for another eight weeks. Turns out my bosses didn't like some of my ideas, I admitted. They let me go. She looked surprised and momentarily didn't know what to say. Well, that's, she searched for the right words. Unfortunate. We'll see. How? Something will come up. But what about you? I asked her, feeling strange, talking as if we were strangers, even though we've been married for 15 years. Are you okay? I thought I saw a hint of sadness in her eyes, but she quickly hid it. It's work she said, trying to smile but not quite managing it. The market's down. That wasn't what I had heard. There are some changes at MRE. Everyone's under a lot of stress. She gestured to show how serious it was. Just then, the kids washed their hands, came racing down the stairs, and jumped to me again. We'll talk later. She turned back to the kitchen. We sat down for dinner. I served the food, then poured a nice cold drink for Jean and me. Dean wanted a can of Mountain Dew while Katie asked for water. We had dinner like a family for the first time in four months. I shared stories about Singapore, telling the kids about fun activities like dragon boat races, indoor golf, ninja tag, and combat archery. It had all been a great experience. After dinner, Dean and Katie ran off together and came back with a wrapped present. Happy birthday, Dad! Jean gasped in surprise. I thanked the kids. Oh, wow, I said. Thank you. Jean looked a bit embarrassed. I'm so sorry, Adam, I completely forgot, she said. I almost reminded her about the gift I gave her on her birthday, but I focused on the kids instead. I opened my present, and it was a box set of Band of Brothers. I had always wanted to have that DVD collection. I thanked them once more, and their big smiles matched mine, happy about giving and receiving gifts. I'll get your present tomorrow, Adam. Jean said, looking sorry. I waved it off, telling her, It's okay. Being home with my family is all the gift I need. Dean and Katie jumped back into my arms, shouting, Love you, Dad! We sat around the table chatting for a while, but soon they had to go do their homework while Jean and I cleaned the kitchen together. What's up with you, Jean? You seem different, I asked her. She raised her hand for a moment as if to stop me. Then her shoulders dropped. I'm not sure, Adam. I just feel down. You've been gone a lot, and this last trip felt too long, she said, looking at me. I miss you. We hardly have time together. Tears rolled down her cheeks. I feel lost. I reached out and pulled her into a hug. She hesitated, but then relaxed against me, 
resting her head on my chest, wrapping her arms around my waist as she quietly cried. We stayed like that for a bit. I wished I could solve her worries, wanting to feel closer to her, but I sensed she just needed comfort right then. She was right, though. In the last six years since I got promoted, I had been busy helping new teams. We had talked about how we would make sacrifices now, hoping to enjoy life more when I turned 50. Eventually, she gently pulled away and suggested I spend time with the kids. I started with Katie, checking her homework, then moved on to Dean. I tucked Katie in and wished her good night before going to Dean's room. Mom's not okay, Dad, he said with worry. She seems upset and isn't doing much at home. She even forgot your birthday. He glanced toward the door, making sure no one else could hear. I think something's really bothering her. Please help her, Dad. I nodded, even though I had no idea what was going on or how to help. As I headed downstairs, I heard Jean talking softly on the phone. When she saw me, she ended the call. Who was that? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Just a colleague from work, she replied, finishing her conversation. We exchanged looks. She seemed distant. Whatever was wrong, she wasn't ready to share it with me. I sensed there were bigger issues, but I was also feeling tired from traveling and had a lot to do. At 9.30, I went to my study and checked the Singapore Stock Exchange. They were 13 hours ahead and had already been trading for two hours. CA was trading at $9.90, which was a slight increase. After that, I went back upstairs to wait for Jean to finish in the bathroom. She washed her face, brushed her teeth, and came into the bedroom wearing a big T-shirt, just like she usually did. I tidied up and got into bed. When I reached out for her, she stiffened for a moment, but then curled up next to me and said softly, Just hold me. I held her for a long time. This wasn't the Jean I knew. Something felt off, but what could it be? Had I been away too long? Was the time apart too hard for her? She had never mentioned it. Had she stopped feeling love? Or was she facing something serious and didn't know how to talk about it? My mind was full of questions without answers until the tiredness and emotional confusion finally overtook me, and I fell into a restless sleep filled with dreams of chasing a shadow. I woke up at 4.30 feeling exhausted and dizzy. I decided to go for a run and promised myself I'd get some melatonin from the pharmacy to help me sleep better. After running for about an hour, I got back to find a note from Jean asking me to make breakfast for the kids and take them to school. It was still early, so I checked my bank account. The money from J.P. Morgan had gone through, so I moved it to my offshore account. I looked at the C.A. shares, and they had dropped in value, now trading at $8.99 USD. They weren't falling fast, but they were definitely going down. I felt torn. Should I focus on my marriage or my money? Could I manage both? I spent time with Dean and Katie asking them what they had done while I was away. They didn't do much except hang out with mom's boss, Anthony Miller. They had played mini golf and gone to the movies and restaurants. Katie seemed clueless, but Dean noticed my reaction and spoke up. It was always with his daughter, Evelyn, dad, he said. She said that mom was such an important part of the company that we were like a big happy family. Katie nodded. Yes, and Evelyn always came too, she chimed in. I smiled and said I was glad they had fun while I was gone. Now that I was back with summer on the way, I wanted us to go on vacation and enjoy our time together. They cheered, and I got hugs from both of them. After dropping them off at school, I called a couple of friends to set up meetings for later. Then, I called George Tallis, my old mentor. He was my manager when I started in trading and taught me a lot about the details that no computer could replace. It's all driven by greed and fear he always reminded me. We chatted for a while. He still lived in Chicago and was managing a small brokerage for a few longtime clients. We talked about my credentials, confirming that I was registered with the SEC and a member of FINRA, along with being registered with the Illinois State Securities Authority and following anti-money laundering rules. We agreed that I would email him a copy of the CA prospectus and discuss it later that day. I stopped by HSHS Community Pharmacy, which was right across from St. John's Hospital. It was conveniently on my way to my first meeting. As I was leaving with my melatonin and vitamins, I saw Jean and Evelyn Miller coming out of St. John's. They were very close together, looking deeply affected by something, their faces showing a shared sadness. I watched them from a distance as they walked with their heads down, looking burdened. They got into a waiting Uber and drove away. 
what was happening. I thought about what had happened the night before, trying to understand. Was my wife not feeling well and hadn't told me? Was Evelyn going through something difficult? They looked upset and were supporting each other, but they didn't seem sick. Had something happened to a friend? No, it felt bigger than that. Their connection was strong, more than just friendship, perhaps. My mind raced to figure it out. Whatever it was, it was clear they shared a deep bond. For each other? Maybe. But it felt different. What now? So I decided to stay calm and went to my meetings. I presented the CA share opportunity covering everything, including the risks involved. Julian Knowles, my first meeting, said he would think about it and talk to his investment group. My next meeting was with Aaron Goldstein, a traditional retailer with a lot of money. He liked the idea right away and, after checking on his computer, agreed to transfer $10 million to my trading account once we finished the paperwork. I was enjoying a coffee at Starbucks on Monroe when George called. He was excited about the prospectus and mentioned he had a group of interested investors. We set up a commission plan based on a sliding scale, where higher returns would lead to higher commissions. Next, I called my dad to discuss the CA opportunity, and he showed interest in investing $100,000. He said he would transfer the money the next day. I then shared my thoughts about Gene. He paused as I spoke, and I could sense him considering my words. My dad always took his time and was careful in his thinking. He had worked as a risk analyst for a big insurance company. When he finally spoke, he sounded worried. Her behavior seemed similar to someone coping with a loss. Well, she wasn't mourning her parents. They were both healthy and living in Arizona, enjoying the warm weather. She had no brothers or sisters, and her few cousins lived far away, making them feel like strangers. We kept talking as I tried to understand his viewpoint, and soon I found myself agreeing with him. He ended the call but mentioned he would send me the details for a private investigator they had used before for insurance issues. Once I got home, I reached out to my contacts in Singapore and Southeast Asia to gather the latest opinions and updated a risk profile on CA. The results were almost the same as my last report. The figures looked good, the management team was trustworthy, and even though the project was just starting, a key point stood out. The management had put their own money into it, showing their commitment to its success. This made me feel confident. It was a signal to move forward. I had a few hours to wait until the stock market opened, and then I would start trading. While I waited, I called the private investigator. His name was Clarence Williams, and I found him on LinkedIn along with a small website for his business, Discreet Solutions. There were no photos of him. When I called, he spoke with a slow, southern accent, which seemed intentional. His questions were clear and sharp. He asked for a $5,000 advance and mentioned that my dad had sent him a lot of business before so he could start working the next day. With everything ready, I walked around drinking coffee trying to pass the time. I was feeling quite anxious. Dean and Katie came home late after practice and I spent as much time with them as I could, but I had to tell them that I had an important deal happening. Jean arrived looking tired but more focused than the night before. I picked up Chinese food on the way home she said as she entered my study and greeted me with a light kiss on the cheek. Are you working? Hi, Jean. It felt right not to share any extra words of affection at that moment. I'd like us to have dinner together as a family, but I have to work later this evening from around seven. Okay, that's fine, I guess. She sounded unsure. I, uh, have your birthday present. She handed me a small gift-wrapped box. The card said, Happy birthday, Adam. Lots of love. Jean. I had given more thoughtful cards to my second cousins. Inside was a bottle of Hugo Boss aftershave. I thanked her and she gave me a quick kiss, which felt a bit distant. We had dinner together as a family. Dean and Katie talked about their day between bites while Jean stayed quiet. We talked about some changes that had happened while I was away. Dean complained that the skateboard park had closed, leaving less for teenagers to do in town. Then Katie mentioned that Mr. Miller, Mom's boss, was turning a property into a shelter for teenagers in need. I looked at Jean with raised eyebrows. Um, yes, well, I might have mentioned it, she said. Tony wants to start a project that will last, and this is his way of doing it. She was a bit vague, and I felt she was holding back some details. I'm surprised I didn't know Miller was involved in that kind of thing, I replied, genuinely surprised. His wife Lynn began it while she was alive, and he kept it going after she passed away, 
she shared, sounding a bit proud. He often uses empty houses he owns for this, but now he wants to turn one into a permanent place. Why? Why not? She responded sharply. It's a great cause that's really needed. The city and state aren't doing much. Many of these teens end up... She paused, clearly not wanting to say too much with the kids at the table. I gestured to Dean and Katie, and they excused themselves so Jean and I could talk more seriously. Why now? That's what I meant, I said, looking at her closely. I had the feeling there was more to her story. Her face changed, and I saw a brief emotion in her eyes. The opportunity is here now, she said, nodding as if to make her point stronger. Okay, it sounds like a good idea. Springfield could really use it, I said, smiling at her. She smiled back as we both got up to clear the table. I tried to keep a pleasant look, even though I felt she wasn't being completely honest. Maybe not everything was a lie, but there was a deeper reason behind her words that felt personal. I helped clean up, took out the trash, and then told her I was going to my study to work. I had an hour before trading started in Singapore, so I settled in to think about everything. I reflected on my marriage, trying to stay calm while holding back the pain that was trying to break through. I knew that if I let it out now, I would struggle to handle what I needed to do. But I also understood that keeping it in might make it harder when it finally came to the surface. I thought about how we had come to this point. Jean and I used to agree on almost everything. We decided together where to live, how to spend our money, our vacations, when we wanted children, and how many. We had a good relationship. Even though the last few years had been tough with my travels, we usually made plans before I returned, and we enjoyed our time together when I got back. But this time, I thought we both understood each other, and it was clear we didn't. It frustrated me. Singapore and Southeast Asia attracted many people looking to connect with foreigners for different reasons. I saw this every day at work, on the subway, at markets, and especially at bars. Many of my co-workers enjoyed spending time with local people, sometimes bringing them into their lives. I found this kind of connection concerning, but didn't mind what others thought. I was thinking about this because even though I had received many friendly advances, I had turned them down. I was devoted to my marriage and to someone I cared deeply about, who I believed cared for me, too. However, her recent actions made me doubt that. I tried to remember if there were any signs leading to this moment, but other than a major breakdown in our communication in the last few weeks, nothing specific came to mind. There was a lot to think about, but for now, I needed to concentrate on my work. When the Singapore market opened, CA was trading at 849. I entered the market carefully. There were many sellers and very few buyers. Any big purchase would cause noticeable changes. I had over 30 million to invest thanks to my contacts and George's connections. They trusted our knowledge. My first buy was for 5 million from someone unknown. After that, a flood of shares came onto the market as worried investors tried to sell and save what they could. I guessed my old contacts were selling their stocks at the order of the head office. I continued buying in five million amounts, waiting for the price to settle, but it was dropping fast. Someone was trying to sell shares they didn't own, hoping to buy them back for less later. The price continued to fall as anxious investors tried to get rid of their shares, aiming for at least 25 cents on the dollar. The lowest point was $5.61 when I made my last purchase of $15 million. With our $30 million, we bought a bit more than 10% of all the shares available. This meant we could put someone on the board since we owned a significant block of shares should we decide to keep them instead of selling for a profit. I called George and we shared a drink over the phone. My choice was a Canadian whiskey on the rocks while George went with his favorite bourbon. In the end, our purchases sparked interest from other investors who jumped in at this low price, causing the share value to rise. By the time I logged off, the price had climbed to 872. The short sellers were beginning to lose money. I rubbed my eyes and checked the time. It was almost two in the morning. After a quick tidy up, I sneaked into bed, forgetting my melatonin tablets in the car. The next morning, I woke up late. Everyone was downstairs. Dean and Katie were finishing breakfast, and Jean was on the phone. I heard her say something about time being of the essence before she noticed me and ended her call. Work, she said with a playful shrug, pouring me a cup of coffee. 
You must have come to bed late? I nodded as I took a sip. How did your trading go? I just shrugged. She didn't need to know that everything except our home depended on C.A. It's still early, we'll have to wait and see, I said. Okay. She smiled and said, You look tired, I'll take the kids to school. Then she walked out of the kitchen calling for Dean and Katie. They yelled their goodbyes as they left. I poured myself another cup of coffee and went to my study. I checked the final share price and was pleased to see it had gone up as the market changed, closing at $10.14. Those who owned shares must have been happy. Meanwhile, those who tried to sell them short probably suffered losses. It was time for the shares to settle down and reflect their real value away from the tricks of competitors. I cleaned up and started sending emails and making calls. First, I caught up with our investors. Then I looked at the Miller Real Estate website. It had the usual mission statement with happy testimonials from sellers and buyers. There was also a section on their community program focused on helping teenagers in trouble. They called it New Horizons Home and claimed to offer housing, meals, training, and support for these teens to help them find jobs, finish school, and improve their lives. There wasn't much else on the website, so I went to Facebook. I searched for Anthony Miller and found lots of pictures of his cars, vacations, and parties. There was a recent group photo from a company event showing the whole MRE team with Anthony in the middle, his daughter Evelyn on one side and Jean on the other. Two things caught my eye. He looked like he had lost a lot of weight and seemed older. The other thing was that Jean was holding onto his arm and looking at him, not the camera. While this didn't mean anything serious, I couldn't help but wonder. I looked at Jean's Facebook pages, which had only a few old pictures and posts about family, including some of us during what I thought of as better times. There wasn't much else there besides positive updates about her work, school, and sports. The last photo of us together was over two years ago. Then I checked Evelyn's Facebook, which had a lot of pictures with Jean in recent years. Some showed her with Jean and Anthony, but nothing seemed odd. They were just spending time together. The latest posts were a bit mysterious, talking about the meaning of life and wishing for good things. I had another chat with Clarence Williams. Just call me Clarence, Adam. I've worked with your father for so long that I feel I know you, I said to him. I mentioned that I wanted to speed up the investigation. He replied that he would try his best, but these things take time. Then I called my dad. His advice was to avoid jumping to conclusions and let the experts do their work stressing the need for patience. It was easy for him to say. I was in a tough spot. Should I reach out to my wife and try to fix what was broken? If I did, would it lead to more sadness later if I found out I had made a mistake? On the other hand, if I did nothing and things could be improved, how much would it hurt to realize I could have helped but didn't? After thinking it over, I decided to consult a lawyer in town. I spoke with a woman who advised that it was usually better to see if the marriage could be saved rather than rushing into a divorce. Very rarely are there winners, she said. Mostly there are just losses. I had one last chance to get answers. One of Jean's colleagues owed me a small favor because I had recommended some good shares to him. He had worked at MRE about six or seven months ago, so I thought I'd ask him for information. He was now at a competing realty company and was free for a late lunch, so we decided to meet at Red Robin for burgers. Chad walked in wearing a company shirt, dress pants, and sunglasses on his head, looking like a true realtor. After some small talk, I got right to the point. He laughed when he realized what I was after. So you're looking for information, Adam? I nodded. Why? I'm trying to learn a bit about MRE, I explained quickly. Some things have come up that worry me. His smile faded. Things changed for Tony after he lost his wife, Dot. He seemed to lose his focus for quite a while. Then his daughter became his reason to get back on track, and over the next year, he started to improve. He looked at me seriously. Your wife and he grew quite close. She was sometimes seen as his office friend. He watched my face to see how I would react before adding, I didn't see anything wrong, but office gossip can be harsh. He rubbed his head. One thing I know is that Tony, Evelyn, and your wife spent a lot of time together, but you were often away, right? I shrugged, feeling lost. We danced around the subject without going into more detail, but just as he was ready to leave, he remembered something. You do know there are rumors that Anthony might have cancer, right? 
We said our goodbyes, and I stayed behind to call St. John's Hospital. I asked for Anthony Miller's room number. It turned out he was in a private room in the cancer ward. After paying for lunch, I headed home. I had a lot on my mind. That evening felt similar to the last two nights. After we finished cleaning up, I stepped outside with a drink and a cigar. I enjoyed the quietness. Jean soon joined me, holding a glass of wine. Can we talk, Adam? She asked. Sure, I replied. You looked at the MRE website, she said, her tone sharp. It seemed like a bigger situation than I thought. If they kept track of visitors, they might reach out to them. So what? I answered. I want to know why. Why what? I asked, puzzled. Why are you looking at the company website? What do you hope to find? Did you also check out everyone's social media? She stared at me, waiting for me to say something wrong. After being married to her for a while, I could tell she was on edge. What did you think you would discover? Just what I found, I said, staying calm. And what was that? She pressed. Why are you asking me this, John? I'm not interrogating you. It just feels like you're hiding something. Social media isn't exactly private, I joked, and she seemed surprised. Evelyn said you also looked at her profile, she continued. Did she? I replied. Yes, she did. She took a deep breath and tried to relax. Why are you acting like this? Like what? I asked. Like this right now, she said, clearly annoyed. Why do you think, Jean? I met her gaze, playfully blowing cigar smoke in her direction, knowing she didn't like it. She waved her hand in front of her face, spilling some wine on her shirt. Please stop it, Adam. Her eyes started to glisten with tears. Usually I would comfort her, but this time felt different. Why are you upset, John? I asked, keeping my tone steady. You're making me feel this way with your attitude, she replied, raising her voice. I continued to blow smoke lightly, filling the air with a haze. Who are you? I asked, and she hesitated, trying to find the words. Finally, she spoke. I'm your wife, Adam Carter. That's who I am, she stated with intensity. I'm not so sure, I said, turning away as she gasped and went inside. After finishing my drink and cigar, I went to my study to work. C.A. was doing well, rising to $11.92, and it seemed like it would keep going up. George and I had a call, and we both felt positive about this trend. I stayed online to watch the market. Aside from some stable blue-chip stocks, the rest of the market had some ups and downs but was in a normal range. C.A. was the only one showing strong growth, although it was still below its starting price. It looked like some were selling to take profits from earlier purchases. I sent a message to one of my team members at J.P. Morgan. He shared that they had sold about half the stock for around 50 cents on the dollar, but were told by my old boss, Joe Rutledge, to hold off on selling the rest. The market seemed to be getting better, and they hoped to break even. We both laughed a bit. He joked that by the end, J.P. Morgan might want to bring me back and let Rutledge go. That night, I took a spare blanket and slept on the sofa bed in my office. The next morning, I checked the closing prices on SGX and was glad to see that CA closed at $13 and some cents. The trend was good, and our investment group had doubled their money. If it reached $25, we'd make over 300% profit. I made breakfast and called the kids to eat while I enjoyed some coffee. I stayed quiet around Jean during the morning and then took the kids to school. After dropping them off, I went to the gym and later stopped by IHOP for a late breakfast. I made some calls and returned home for a two-hour meeting with George. We talked about the idea of starting a joint brokerage with offices in Springfield and Chicago. We shared ideas and agreed that he would work on the structure and ownership of the new business while I would create a marketing plan. I was focused on my work late in the afternoon when I heard Jean come in. She was alone. I've dropped the kids off with the Beckers for the night, she said. We need to talk. She led me to the living room where she had poured me a drink and herself some wine. I sat down and waited for her to speak, believing it was better to stay quiet. Finally, she broke the silence. I don't know how you see things, Adam, but I haven't made any assumptions yet. Well, I feel like you're not being respectful to me. I recognized she had a point. Is that how you see it? Disrespect? I raised my eyebrow. She nodded but then paused and tears filled her eyes. I'm sorry, Adam. You're hardly ever home. It's like we're strangers. She took a moment to gather herself, 
So after 17 years were strangers because I was away for four months, all the video calls and messages meant nothing? I've had a lot on my plate while you've been gone. She wiped her tears. But you're my husband and I'm your wife. That's what matters. She looked at me expecting agreement. Then she got up and excused herself. I sat there sipping my drink, considering her feelings. I heard her phone ring and caught bits of her conversation. Soon after, I could hear the bath running. It took some time before she came back down. She wore a soft, gray dress that fell just above her knees, with black shoes and a lovely string of pearls I had bought her years ago. I have to say, for a 39-year-old mother of two, she looked wonderful, more vibrant than many younger women. Go take a shower and get dressed, she encouraged me. I'll make a reservation at Chesapeake Seafood Restaurant. I was ready in about 15 minutes. While getting dressed, I thought I heard her on the phone again. I chose not to ask her about it and kept quiet. We took an Uber to the restaurant, where she began with a gin and tonic since Jean had recently started enjoying gin. I decided on a Singapore gin sling to keep things fun. Once we were seated, she ordered a mussel hot pot, while I picked half a dozen oysters for a starter. We enjoyed some Chardonnay and talked about the kids. She didn't seem overly worried about my job situation. You're one of the smartest people I know, Adam. I know you'll find a job soon, she said, smiling at me, unaware that I felt like an outsider in the corporate world. Our savings will hold us over until then. I chuckled softly, feeling both amused and anxious. She didn't realize that our future depended on my determination with C.A. But the evening got better as we talked about friends, family, and everyday topics that keep a marriage strong. She asked about some of my old work colleagues she had met before, and I carefully avoided any serious discussions until I had more answers. For the main course, I enjoyed the captain's platter, and she chose lobster. She poured me more wine, making me wonder if she wanted me to have a great evening. The mood between us lightened, and she seemed truly happy to be together. She held my hand and looked into my eyes, focused on me. After finishing dinner, instead of heading home, she suggested we check out the gin mill for some specialty gins. We took a taxi to the busy cocktail bar. Once there, we got the bartender's attention and ordered Negronis. We sipped our drinks, leaning into one another with Jean's arm around me. The evening felt lively, and I loved the connection we had. Adam and Jean spent a joyful evening together, enjoying their time out. After a few drinks and some laughter, they decided to leave the bar. They quickly paid the bill and caught a taxi home. On the way, they shared a quiet, affectionate moment. Once home, they continued to enjoy each other's company, finding comfort in their shared space. The warm lighting and cozy atmosphere added to the sense of closeness as they settled in for the night. Adam and Jean shared a special moment together, feeling a close bond. They enjoyed being near each other and appreciated the warmth of their connection. After a long time apart, their time together felt comforting. They embraced this moment, filled with care and fondness for one another. The evening flowed naturally as they enjoyed their reunion, finding peace in the familiarity of their relationship and reconnecting on a deep emotional level. They spent a quiet night, relishing each other's company. The next morning, Jean made breakfast, joking about their time together. They talked over their meal, discussing chores for the day. Afterward, Jean left to pick up the kids, leaving Adam to begin his day. While he worked in the backyard, he received a call from Clarence Williams. Can we talk? He asked, causing Adam's heart to race. They arranged to meet at a downtown coffee shop. Adam left his tasks unfinished, tidied up, and headed there. When he arrived, he saw Clarence waiting and waved him over. Clarence looked different from what Adam had expected. He was a small man, possibly about five foot seven or eight. He was thin, with gray hair and a simple appearance. He wore dark pants, a shirt, and an old sports jacket and looked quite ordinary. Adam imagined he drove an average car. But his fancy cell phone surprised Adam, showing that he was creating a certain image of being unassuming. When they shook hands, Adam felt the strength in Clarence's grip, which was surprising compared to his appearance. Let's get to the point, mister. Carter, Clarence said directly. We haven't found any records of your wife visiting hotels or having secret meetings. However, we have enough information to confirm that she has been involved with her boss, Anthony Miller, for at least two years. This seems to be known at the office. 
His daughter, Evelyn, appears to know about it and has even helped them meet. They used to see each other often during the week, and when you were away, she would sometimes have the children stay at friends' houses while spending weekends with him. Clarence's tone was serious, trying to deliver the news before Adam could react. Adam felt his heart pounding in his chest, gripping the table to stay steady. It was one thing to have suspicions. To hear someone else confirm them felt completely different. A mix of anger and sadness washed over him. Clarence continued speaking, but Adam felt lost in his thoughts, overwhelmed with emotions. Miller has been given bad news about his health. He might only have a few months left to live. What? I struggled to understand what I was hearing. What did you say? I said that Mr. Miller has pancreatic cancer. He is receiving treatment again, but it doesn't seem to be helping. This news confirmed what I had heard before, but I didn't know that his condition was so serious and close to the end. Now I could see why Jean was acting the way she was. She was clearly upset, worrying about the man she cared for and trying to deal with a tough reality. I wanted to share my feelings with Clarence, not just because he was my friend, but because I needed someone to talk to. Clarence had a lot of wisdom. Many people try to downplay their actions by saying it's only physical, but that's not true, Mr. Carter. He took a sip of his nearly cold coffee and winced. It's about more than just that. There's a connection in relationships. He seemed to remember earlier talks and frowned. People need to feel valued to bond, he added. No one gets into a long-term relationship for just physical reasons. It might start that way, but emotions quickly become important. Love can lead someone to think they can care for more than one person at the same time. He looked at me to see how I felt about this. Relationships are more than just spending time together. They're about sharing experiences like eating out, enjoying movies, taking walks, and talking about ideas, similar to any serious partnership. They build a connection and share hopes and dreams while often wishing their relationship could be what they really want. He nodded as if he believed what he was saying. Sometimes they find faults in their partner to make sense of their actions, sharing those thoughts with someone else to justify what they do. I was taken aback and saddened by his words, though I understood it would have been easier to think they were only together for physical reasons. My wife was seeing another man who brought her happiness without the responsibilities of daily life. She gave him her full attention, while he offered an escape from the routine of marriage, which often felt dull. We talked for a little while longer before deciding to pause our investigation as I thought about my next steps. After he left, I reflected on what was ahead. One reality became clear. My marriage was ending. The idea of staying together for the sake of our children didn't feel right to me. Although being away from my kids would be hard, many families faced similar situations. I accepted that mine would not be different. I took a sip of my cooling coffee. The pain I felt was deep, and at the very least, there would be consequences for Jean and Miller. I tried to calm my feelings, knowing that my anger and hurt wouldn't help me. I remembered my time in the Far East, where I met many leaders who saw business and life as long-lasting. They often dealt with problems like families in the South, where issues only ended when one side completely lost. That sounded easy, but it was tough for me. I wasn't the leader of a big company. I was just an ordinary person living a simple life. I had no special skills or anyone who could really help me. I was certain I had to handle this alone. I ordered more coffee and thought about how to deal with my frustrations regarding a man who was causing trouble. My plan with Jean was to take away the things she loved most in life. It wouldn't be easy, but I was starting to think of a strategy. First, I needed to think about Miller. He hadn't promised me anything but he knew I was married to Jean and still chose to pursue her. This showed he didn't care about my family. Something had to be done. My anger, mixed with my pain, was coming back. I remembered from work evaluations that I had two main traits to think about. I took risks, which could be a problem in a careful work setting, and I could be very stubborn. These traits were now pushing me to find a solution no matter what it took. I wouldn't give up until I saw change. A plan was beginning to develop. I reached out to Clarence and asked him to find people who had difficulties and needed help, which the Millers had been involved with. Although my plan wasn't clear yet, it was an important step toward what I wanted. Thinking back to 2014, I recalled a trip to Kenya for three weeks, 
where I went deep sea fishing with the local team during a free weekend. I learned something important. You need to catch smaller fish before you can go after the big ones. You catch the active smaller fish, then use it as bait to attract bigger fish, like marlin. During that trip I succeeded, but felt sad seeing the marlin struggle for its life. I promised myself I wouldn't try big game fishing again, but the lesson about catching the marlin gave me a good plan. I drove home, practicing my breathing until I felt calm, ready to return to the mood I had before. Jean still wasn't back, so I got to work on the chores I had left unfinished. She came back later with Dean and Katie, and we fired up the grill for steaks, corn on the cob, coleslaw, and warmed baguettes. I spent the afternoon being a caring father and a supportive husband. I showed love and tried my best. It felt like I was two people, the warm, loving man on the outside and a more doubtful voice inside me. I suddenly saw how easily someone could influence feelings with kind words and genuine eye contact. Jean seemed to respond positively. I thought about this balance and the complexities of relationships. Cynical Adam thought that with her partner gone, Jean might see me as a backup. My time with Dean and Katie felt real, while my moments with Jean seemed a bit rehearsed, even if she was fully engaged. I made a note to remember this for the future. The next few days blended into a strange routine. I was both living a role and watching myself in that role. I wondered if actors feel the same way when they see themselves play parts on screen. On a brighter note, George and I had successfully set up the new trading company, registered it in Singapore, and transferred the CA stock portfolio without any issues. The good news didn't stop there. After a rocky start, CA was trading at $16.33 and going up. We had already more than doubled our investment and were aiming for what I hoped would be a threefold return. Since I had become more detached, I felt the need to tighten my security. I put strong measures in place that needed both a fingerprint and a password. I also encrypted all my files and emails. I made sure to turn off my laptop and deleted any unknown emails without looking at them. Next, I downloaded what I needed on my phone to the cloud, completely reset my phone, and then reloaded the files I wanted. After that, I had little to do but look into other interesting stock listings and reach out to possible investors I knew from J.P. Morgan to prepare for pitching them for some of their business. I didn't worry much about the non-compete agreement, as being fired made it mostly invalid. Things had gone quiet in my personal life while I waited for news, which came on Thursday when I got a thumb drive from Clarence. We met at a different coffee shop this time because I was feeling uneasy, though I wasn't sure why. He had gathered a list of 14 women he could find, with short biographies included, and some even had old photographs. Five of them still lived nearby. One had faced some serious struggles, indicating that Miller's help hadn't worked as well as we hoped. There was a contact number for her. I went out and bought a cheap phone, then called her. We agreed to meet at a motel on the edge of the city. She told me how much it would cost, and that I would have to pay for the room. She arrived on time in the afternoon. She was small and thin, and I noticed her unique tattoos. Her name was Layla, and she stood at the door. Show me the money, were her first words. I pulled out the cash and put it on the bed, inviting her to sit down. She did. I raised my hand to pause. How would you like to earn a thousand? I asked, but she quickly showed her discomfort and seemed ready to leave. I don't do that sort of thing. I promise I'm not asking for anything wrong. I'll pay for information. What kind? I want to know about the home for women you were in a few years ago. She hesitated, but after a little back and forth, began to tell her story. In short, she left home after school because of family problems and found herself living on the streets. When things got tough, she looked for any way to survive. One encounter turned risky, and she was in a bad spot until someone reached out for help. That led her to Mrs. Miller, who offered her a place to stay after she got help. She said she was there for almost six months until it became too strict for her which made her decide to leave. She finished her story, and we shared a quiet moment of understanding. Her story was common, but still sad. I wondered if my plans would make me just like those who hurt her, but my need for revenge was stronger than my doubts. So when you lived there, did they treat you badly right away, or did it get worse over time? She blinked quickly, trying to think about my question. She shook her head, then stopped. I could see her thinking. How much? I'm thinking 5,000. I started the negotiation. 
Why? I thought for a moment. Even with her past, she was a skilled negotiator. Miller messed up my marriage, and I want to get back at him. I looked for signs of hesitation in her. Would she choose money or do the right thing? Twenty thousand, she said with a firm smile, watching my reaction. I considered it and thought about how reliable she seemed. She appeared confident. What? I can see you wondering if spending twenty thousand on me will help you. She was clever. She leaned in closer, her focus strong. Make it twenty-five, and I'll show you how powerful the Me Too movement can be. We needed to plan together, and we talked about how the money would be sent. She explained that she wanted the money to start over since she had a young daughter and needed to change her life. I made her a real offer. If things went well, I would help her find a job in Chicago. This made her smile. Really? She asked, eyes wide with hope. Really? Are you just saying that to get what you want? She looked both excited and a bit worried, like someone grabbing a chance that might disappear. I promised her it was a true offer. We agreed she would keep her word, and we'd meet to talk about the next steps when she felt ready. We exchanged contact details. I gave her my temporary phone number and asked her to save it under Jerry. We can hang out if you'd like, she said, misunderstanding what I intended. I politely declined, signaling that part was done. At home, I struggled with my thoughts while Jean focused on Miller's project, not knowing my real plans. I tried to get involved in her life as much as possible, asking about how her work was going. We spent time cooking and eating together, just like before. I connected with her but kept my emotions at bay, watching everything with a practical mindset. I didn't get too close with her during that week, but I had moments of closeness without asking for permission. Every other morning I spent time with her until I felt good, without giving anything back. I thought, why worry? She owed me a lot and the divorce would cost me, so I felt I deserved this. Surprisingly, instead of being upset, she seemed to welcome my behavior. One Friday, she woke up, turned to me, and offered her affection without me needing to ask. Maybe she liked this new way we were interacting, or perhaps she was trying to hold on to her role as my wife while facing the loss of her partner. After our moment, while having breakfast, she mentioned she would be busy preparing for the New Horizons home opening on Monday at 10. I already knew about it. It was all over the company's website and social media. I pretended to be interested and asked her questions without prying too much. They had invited the mayor and his team to cut the ribbon, along with many local reporters, including CBS. Has Tony stopped his treatment so he can come? I heard her asking, likely to Evelyn, but I couldn't catch the answer. It will be a big moment. She let out a small sigh. Not if I had anything to do with it. It was time to act. My divorce papers were ready. All that was needed was for me to give the go-ahead. Illinois had become a no-fault state, and I couldn't sue Miller for emotional loss, so irreconcilable differences it was. I began my day with SGX. Our shares had hit their starting price and were steadily going up. It was a nice way to start Friday. I made myself a coffee and listened to WMA radio. At 9.30, there was an interview with Evelyn. She spoke about a kind project that MRE and her father, Anthony Miller, had started. It was really touching, like a warm hug. She explained how the New Horizons home was a development of a program her mother had begun, and her father had kept it going after her mother passed away. They now had a chance to make it a full-time and well-funded project, but they needed help and donations from the community. The host seemed very excited as they talked about its importance and opened the lines for listeners. Many callers were positive and promised to donate. The host said he would put details for donations on WMA's website, and Evelyn added that there were more details on the MRE and New Horizons websites. Evelyn was surprised when a caller, clearly upset, claimed that the home had allowed Mr. Miller to mistreat women. Evelyn didn't believe it and defended her father, saying he would never do such a thing. The caller, sounding very hurt, explained that her life had been changed in ways she never wanted, blaming it all on Evelyn's father. Then the line went silent, leaving everyone in disbelief. The host tried to manage the situation, not sure if they should continue the interview or address the serious claim. As more callers shared their thoughts, the show became a mix of emotions. Some supported the caller, while others questioned her words. In the midst of this, another caller cautiously shared a similar story. 
The discussion grew more intense, with listeners from other stations joining in, adding to the noise. The weight of the accusations was heavy, and many people were left thinking about how serious the claims were and what the truth really was. Evelyn struggled to understand the father she knew in light of the stories being shared. I shared my worries about my wife working for MRE and the New Horizons Home Project. She was unsure but promised to look into it. She noted that if the accusations were true, it would be a huge scandal in Springfield. By lunchtime, the topic had faded a bit on the radio. Hosts didn't want to share their views, but social media, especially Twitter, was buzzing with activity. At first, the responses were mixed, but soon it turned into a strong backlash against anyone who supported Miller. Many women started talking about their experiences of mistreatment. Some shared detailed stories, while others spoke of similar situations. This made things very confusing. Feeling overwhelmed, I turned off the news. I took some medicine for my headache that was coming on. With my children still at school, I felt a wave of stress and emotions wash over me. I changed my clothes and took a warm shower, letting the water help me relax. As I sat under the spray, I felt a deep sense of loss, like the time when I lost my mom. A saying by Nietzsche about facing challenges echoed in my mind. Miller had hurt me, but I had also started a situation that grew too big for me to manage. All I could do was hold on and wait for things to get better. Later, I made dinner for my kids, cooking a chicken stir-fry and a small salad. We waited for Jean, but when she didn't come, I tried to call, only to find her phone was off. After dinner, I saved some food for her in the microwave and a small bowl of salad in the fridge. Dean, Katie, and I played a board game called Forbidden Island, but still, there was no sign of Jean. By ten o'clock, the kids were in their rooms, and I was alone in the living room when she finally arrived. She looked tired, her face showing the burden she carried. Have you heard? She took a deep breath. Have you heard all the terrible things they're saying about Tony? She sat down heavily, and I gave her a glass of cognac, which she drank quickly. I have. It seems your boss is in some serious trouble, I said calmly. Where there's smoke, there's often fire. No, Adam, he's a good man. He'd never do anything like that. It was time to dig deeper. Jean, I said. She looked up from her drink. You might not know him well, just like you don't know me completely. I pressed on. We're married, so you know what I can do, just like I know you. I met her eyes. You may see Miller as your boss, but what is he really like? I noticed the conflict in her thoughts and feelings. No, no, he's a good man. He'd never do something like that. I would know. I gave her a confused look. But how, Jean? How would you really know? He's just your boss. He could be hiding many things. I don't know him well, but there's something about him that feels off. He's the kind of man you wouldn't want around your family. She gasped. Has he ever acted inappropriately toward you? I watched her face go pale, pretending not to notice. No, no, never. How can you even ask that? She tried to look angry, but appeared mostly upset. Because you're a wonderful person, Jean, and if what they say about him is true, then he must not be trustworthy. Tears filled her eyes as she stared at her drink, but it offered no answers. She finished it and slowly went upstairs. She greeted Dean and Katie, and soon I heard the shower running. I finished my drink and went to bed. When she came out of the shower, I pretended to be asleep. She walked downstairs in a robe. I got out of bed and went to the landing. She was talking to someone, probably Evelyn, judging by the voice. She kept saying nightmare. Then she asked, but why? Why would more than one woman say she was hurt? Finally, she noted that she didn't think this would be resolved easily. She was right. Next, she made another call. Hi, Tony, I heard her say. I caught bits of the conversation as she tried to explain that everything would be sorted out and that it was just a big misunderstanding. I could hardly hear since she moved into the kitchen, but I caught her last words, I love you too. The microwave beeped, and she likely spent some time eating alone. By the time she came to bed, I had already fallen asleep. On Saturday, I woke up first, made breakfast, and then took Dean and Katie to their sports practice. I returned home while on the phone with Vicky. She told me another woman had come forward, making it four so far. She also mentioned that her sources in the mayor's office said the whole project was now considered harmful, and they were pulling away from it. Following that, several community groups also cut ties. By mid-morning, the attorney general's office announced they would be investigating the matter fully.
When I got home, Jean was not there. The SGX was closed, so I had little to do. I talked with George about business and with my dad about my marriage. He agreed that it was broken beyond repair. He said he felt bad for Dean and Katie, but like many kids across the country, they would learn to manage. I called Jean. Where are you? Evelyn and I are with the company lawyers trying to handle these claims. Are you sure you should be doing this? I said, adding concern to my voice. The consequences could be serious, and you don't want to get caught in the middle. She argued with me just like I expected, but their legal efforts didn't seem to help. On Saturday afternoon and Sunday, which are usually their busiest open house days, MRE had less than 20% of their usual visitors. By Monday morning, the phone was ringing constantly with cancellations and retractions of sales agreements. They decided to postpone the opening of New Horizons home until the negative attention faded. On that Monday, another woman came forward in a surprising way. This woman was married to a wealthy business owner and was well-known in the community. She took out a quarter-page advertisement in the local paper, claiming that Miller had acted wrongly during her brief stay at a home for troubled teens. As it turned out, she had been dealing with some personal problems with her boyfriend. He lost his job, she followed, and soon they faced serious challenges. He got involved with some risky people and vanished, leaving her alone. Eventually, she was in a tough spot, and a police officer who was familiar with the home brought her there. She said she stayed at the home for eight days before they reached out to her parents. During that time, the man known as Mr. Miller had behaved inappropriately on two occasions. She shared her lawyer's contact information for any other women who had similar experiences with Miller, hoping to start a group effort. By the end of that week, five important things happened. First, Miller was questioned by the district attorney in the hospital, and soon his health declined. Second, three women had come forward to talk to the police, sharing their stories. Interestingly, all those events had taken place within a short time, about five years before. Third, media attention grew so much that MRE decided to shut down until further notice. Jean talked to me every night about how hard Evelyn was trying to keep the business afloat while salespeople were leaving and taking customers with them. Fourth, CA stock rose above $24, and I was slowly selling some shares, which were quickly being bought without affecting the price. Adam walked into the living room and noticed the tension. Jean was in tears, and Evelyn was comforting her. Ladies, Adam said, placing three champagne glasses on the table and pouring each a drink. The room felt heavy with unspoken feelings as they received the glasses. Cheers, Adam said, taking a sip. But instead of happiness, the mood grew somber. Jean's voice shook. You're divorcing me? I thought we were a family. The open envelope on the coffee table confirmed her worst fears. Evelyn, sounding disappointed, added, How could you do this, Adam? Don't you care about Jean? Adam's expression turned serious. Drink up, Jean. We're marking a new beginning. He took another sip, his mood cold. Jean looked at him with fear in her eyes. But I thought we were okay. Adam's laugh echoed harshly in the quiet room. You mean all those moments together? I hope you didn't think it meant anything more. The silence that followed felt heavy, the impact of his words lingering in the air. I poured myself more champagne and offered the bottle to the girls, noticing how uneasy they looked. Evelyn had dropped her flute, making quite a mess, while Jean looked at me worriedly, unhappy about the broken glass. So, does that mean no more champagne? I asked jokingly. You've left me alone for way too long. I just wanted some company, Evelyn said, her eyes dropping away from mine. I get it, I replied, forcing a smile. But we need to be honest with each other. Evelyn reacted quickly. And how many women were you with while you were gone? You guys always want us to be perfect while you enjoy your freedom. Don't judge all men because of what your father did. Just because he acted poorly doesn't mean everyone else will too. I looked at Evelyn, hoping she would stand up for herself, but the fear in her eyes showed she understood the situation clearly. It was better not to push things further. You have to accept the true nature of your father's actions, I said firmly. His name is associated with shame. Eventually, people will find out what really happened. Evelyn reacted strongly. She shook with emotion, tears streaming down her face. I could feel her frustration, wishing she could fight back. 
It seems like you might have been part of these events, just like others, I continued, noticing her growing worry. I might have to tell the media about this. She panicked. No, please, that can't be true. My father is a good man. I turned back to Jean. You have two hours to pack up and leave. If you're still here when I come back, I will let everyone know what's been happening. In fact, I might even invite them to ask you about your part in this mess. How dare you, she said angrily. I have nothing to be sorry for. Well, except for the secrets. I'll move out, but I'll talk to a lawyer first, and then we'll see what happens. Jean was certainly sounding more confident. Two hours, I reminded her. I left and got into my car, but only a short way down the street I began to feel the weight of everything. My heart raced and I felt uneasy. It took about 15 minutes before I settled down enough to keep driving. I drove without a clear direction for a while. Finally, I gathered my thoughts and called my dad. I told him about my plans with Jean and reminded him to watch over Dean and Katie. While Jean could visit, she must not be alone with them. We talked as I drove until my gas light came on. I found a station, filled up, and realized how far I had gone. It was already past ten when I got back home. The house felt empty and sad, filled with memories of happier times. The silence hung heavily, making it hard to sleep. Two thousand five hundred years ago, Socrates said that a life without self-reflection isn't worth living. As I lay in bed, I tried to avoid thinking too much about the mess I had made in my quest for revenge. I felt sure of one thing. It was too late to change my course. I worried that while social media could cause a stir, if things went to court, everything could fall apart. Would I end up caught up in it? I realized I needed to help Layla leave town to distance myself from the trouble. Determined to take action, I finally drifted into an uneasy sleep. The next morning, I woke up feeling just as tired as I had the night before. After going through my morning routine, I headed downtown for breakfast. I called the kids, they were doing okay, but Dean was starting to feel that something wasn't right at home. I promised I would talk to him and Katie soon. While sipping my coffee, I reached out to Layla on a disposable phone. So, did I meet your expectations? I told her that she had. We discussed her plans, and she confirmed she would be leaving for Chicago the next day. I had moved money from my offshore account to one of George's accounts, and he sent smaller amounts to a bank account Layla set up, making her $25,000 richer. She was headed for a job as an assistant in property management, arranged by one of George's contacts who handled commercial properties. While finishing my coffee, I received a call from Vicky. Three women have hired lawyers and are taking action against Miller, she told me. Papers would be served on Monday. We chatted for a bit longer. She mentioned that she and her news team were surprised by how fast everything had unfolded, but she said it was not shocking given the current situation. Once the first woman, Layla, made serious claims public, the others soon followed, similar to the Harvey Weinstein case. I spent the rest of Saturday with Dean and Katie. I told them that their mom and I would be divorcing because she had been unfaithful with her boss, Anthony Miller. Katie didn't quite understand what that meant, but Dean did. Was she with Mr. Miller, Dad? I nodded, feeling sad. Yes, they had been involved for a while. Katie cried while Dean stayed calm. We took a moment to gather ourselves, and then we invited my dad to join us at the driving range to hit some golf balls. Dean and Katie used some of my older clubs and both had a good natural swing. We ended the day at a Greek restaurant for dinner, and eventually we turned in early. I returned to my quiet house and faced another sleepless night. On Sunday, I took calls from her parents. They wanted to know if there was any chance for us to get back together. For the sake of the kids, they said. How can I fix things with someone who has been unfaithful for years, and the person involved has serious accusations against him? I asked. There were surprised reactions all around. Living in Arizona had kept them unaware of the shocking news from Illinois. It will all come out in court, I promised them, hoping they would see their daughter in a new light. Life went on, mostly slow and troubled. Dean and Katie were back at home with me, and my dad had moved in to lend a hand. This helped me concentrate on my business, which was doing well as George and I were getting many positive referrals. By the end of the second week, the excitement over Miller was calming down a bit. Vicky told me that a fourth woman had joined the class action lawsuit against him. But not Layla, I wondered. That was odd. She was smart and seemed capable enough to go after a share of the settlement. 
Oh, well, that was something to think about later. I had a meeting planned between Jean's lawyers and mine to discuss the division of our assets. I had set up investment accounts for Dean and Katie's education with what had been our shared money, so that part was safe. My last salary and payouts from J.P. Morgan had gone directly into my offshore account, and her lawyers were still trying to get documents from my old employer. Although they suspected there was significant money involved, they had no idea how much. But it wouldn't be long before they requested the HR records. I made it clear that I would not pay her anything since she had a job and earned a decent income. She argued that there should have been at least 250000 in cash and near-cash assets. I explained that those funds had been lost in poor investments. Both Jean and her lawyer looked doubtful, but I just laughed. Accept the deal, Jean. If not, I'll take the house payment off the table and we can fight over that too until you run out of money for lawyers. I'll leave you in a tough spot financially. Why are you being so unfair? She glared at me. I deserve half of everything from our marriage. Go ask your other husband for money, John. It looks like you had more of a relationship with him than with me. Better be quick. He might not have much left after everything going on. I wish I could say it ended there, but it didn't. It dragged on for months. I had the upper hand, and my frustration grew. She flipped between meetings, sometimes saying I was exaggerating things and other times blaming me for her decisions. Then she wanted to know why we had to get divorced and if there was any chance we could fix things. Soon, I heard she had plans to take as much as she could. During another meeting where I stood firm, her lawyer said he would arrange for her to return to the house right away. I gave her my biggest smile. Be careful around me, Jean, or I will let everyone know about your wrong actions. She turned pale and looked very shaken. Go ahead, see what happens next. As I walked out of her lawyer's office, I saw Evelyn sitting in the waiting area. She looked at me with dislike. I smiled at her, and for a moment, her attitude changed. You should have stepped back, Evelyn. Now, you'll have to deal with what comes next. Two days later, Layla received $5,000, and the local news was filled with stories about how Evelyn Miller had helped her father with serious wrongdoing. The district attorney's office faced questions about not arresting him or taking action against his daughter. At a press conference, the DA said they were still looking into things. The media kept pressing, and the public was still upset about previous events. Soon, people were calling for accountability from Evelyn Miller as well. Miller was sued by four women who had spoken out. I felt worried and started having restless nights. Taking this to court was a big chance for me and could easily ruin everything. It was week six since I got back from Singapore. I was working from home as usual when the doorbell rang. It was Evelyn. What do you want? I was not in the mood to be nice. Can we talk, Adam? No, I don't want anything to do with you. I stared at her and closed the door, leaving her outside. She rang the bell again, just as I expected. Please, Adam, just for a moment, she begged. I almost laughed. Where had her confidence gone? Instead, I said, I don't believe you. You only want to use my words for yourself. I swear I won't. She looked desperate. All right. Her eyes brightened, but I raised my hand to stop her. But first, leave your bag and phone in your car. I watched her do it. Stay here. I closed the door and quickly set up my second phone to record the conversation. I opened the door and indicated for her to come in. Take a seat, I said firmly. Seriously, what are you doing? She asked. I'm just being careful. I motioned for her to sit down. Okay, let's talk. I relaxed and moved to the nearest couch. She seemed unsure whether to stay standing or sit, but eventually chose a chair across from me, on the edge as if ready to leave at any moment. She pushed some hair behind her ear and took a breath. I thought you were a nice guy, Adam. She looked into my eyes for answers. Yeah, nice guys finish last, don't they? She nodded as if I had confirmed something for her. I know it's you, Adam. You're the one who started this whole mess. I just looked at her without showing any feelings. Please stop this now, Adam. I stayed quiet and she tried a new approach. I know you're hurt by Jean's relationship with my father. Who wouldn't be? But what people are saying about my father isn't true and it needs to stop. It must be taken back. I chuckled softly. There's nothing I can do, Evelyn. The courts will handle it now. Please, Adam, I know you can put a stop to this. I gave her a faint smile. 
Now that your life has fallen apart, you want my help. Where were you when your father was with my wife? Her face turned red. Oh, yes, you were making sure she was going along with his plans. We looked at each other in silence for a long time. I could see her trying to find the right words to convince me. Finally, she asked, When will you stop, Adam? When will you be satisfied? Her eyes grew heavy, tears streamed down her cheeks, and she seemed to lose her strength. She wasn't pretending, she felt beaten. Not until your family is completely shattered, Evelyn. She flinched at my words, her eyes widened. This won't stop, there will be no truce, there will be no peace until your family is fully destroyed. I spoke slowly so she would understand that I was serious. She couldn't back out, this was real, and it would only end with the complete downfall of the Millers. She took in my words, falling silent as she thought it over. Then she surprised me by trying again. Do you want revenge, Adam? Do you want to be with me? Make me suffer like... She wrung her hands and looked at the floor, avoiding my gaze. She was in her thirties, unmarried and without children. Her social media showed she had recently ended a relationship, so she was alone. I noted her fit appearance and how she followed current trends. Are you suggesting we go to your father's hospital room to confront him together? I raised an eyebrow. And after that, facing your father, do you think that will solve anything? She turned pale and stood up, crossing her arms defensively. You heartless person, she yelled. How dare you? I stepped closer and held her arms gently. I'm not the one who took advantage of others. Your father did, and he will face the consequences just as you and everything you've built will. She staggered to the door and hurried to her car, unsteady as she drove off. I watched her struggle down the street, feeling mixed emotions, a sense of satisfaction at her discomfort, and an uneasy feeling about being so harsh towards someone else. It was early, but I felt like I needed a drink, maybe more than one. The rest of the week had me moving between lawyers' offices. Meanwhile, I focused on getting more clients. There was a small IT company listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that looked promising, along with a natural gas exploration company drilling in the Indian Ocean near South Africa and Mozambique, which was listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. George and I were finishing our tasks before showing everything to the investor group. The lawsuit by four women against Miller was moving forward. Evelyn and her team of lawyers were working hard to make things right and hoped to settle the case without going to court. The district attorney was unsure about how to deal with a man who was close to the end of his life, so we waited nervously for updates. A notable piece of information came out from private talks between the women and the Millers. When Evelyn insisted that her father did nothing wrong and claimed the women were not honest, one of the women shot back with a comment about the past. This stirred a lot of discussions. I heard that the Millers had lost a lot of money. They sold all their properties, and the women received payments of more than two million each. The exact figures weren't shared, but it was a large amount. This basically ended MRE. I needed one last thing to find closure, so I went to the hospital. I entered Miller's room confidently, wanting him to understand the impact of his actions. You hurt my family, and your reputation is damaged, I said, looking at him without feeling sorry. You will leave this world knowing that many see you poorly, and your company has fallen apart. He lived for just two more days. Evelyn arranged for him to be cremated. At the small gathering afterward, there were only five people there. Jean was one of them. She said she wanted to take Dean and Katie with her, but I firmly told her I wouldn't allow it. You would, wouldn't you? She looked at me, feeling both scared and surprised. I didn't think you'd go this far. You were the cause of his downfall, right? Her voice shook. And for what? Because he and I had a special connection? You ruined so many lives. Tears fell down her cheeks. I replied coldly, You played a part in this, Jean. You should have been honest with me. If you wanted someone else, you could have told me, and we could have ended it peacefully. But you chose to treat me poorly. She paused for a moment, reflecting. I loved Tony, she said softly. He was there for me when I needed him. With you, I often felt like I was in second place to your job. While she searched her bag for a tissue, she added, after we had Dean and Katie, I felt even more left out. It was all about your work. The kids and I just got what was left over. She looked me straight in the eyes. I needed someone who made me feel important for once.
I could have walked away and let her keep her memories, but I didn't. I pulled out my phone. Listen to this. Was she worth it? I played back his words. No, nothing was worth this. His response was weak. You've messed up everything I worked so hard to create. I let out a harsh laugh. You did this to yourself, Miller. You made your own decisions. How? How did you find out? What do you mean? How did you know about my dealings with them? There was a long pause as I tried to understand. Then I erupted with laughter and dropped the phone. After a moment, I calmed down. I had no idea. I laughed again. Oh, how ironic. I really didn't know, Miller. I thought I was just guessing, but now I understood why those four women approached you. Just a tiny crack, and everything fell apart. Forget you, Carter. He breathed heavily. Those women owed me. He tried to sit up, showing he still had some spirit. I was good to your wife, and she liked it. She chose me over you. I bet those were the biggest mistakes you ever made, Miller. She cost you everything, and now everyone knows who you really are. Jean collapsed on the floor and I walked away. She was no longer my concern. Asterisk, asterisk. Epilogue. Asterisk, asterisk. When MRE was quickly selling off its properties for cash, I bought the house they were changing into the New Horizons home for a great price. It took some work to get everyone together, but everything came together like it was meant to happen. Once the deal was done, I placed ads in local papers and went on the radio to announce that I had bought the New Horizons home. I planned to turn it into a halfway house for women in need, run entirely by women without any men involved in running everyday tasks. I renamed it the Joy Carter Home in honor of my mother. My dad was emotional and proud. Dean and Katie were impressed. The home was put in a trust. My father and I became trustees along with the four women who had taken legal action against Miller. They were eager to help and shared some of their new resources to make our vision a reality. Local and regional news called it a Phoenix Project and praised the women and me, although I tried to stay out of the spotlight. Besides creating a social responsibility project, it also helped improve my position in front of the judge during my divorce. In the end, Jean received primary custody. I would be paying support until Dean and Katie turned 18. Jean could stay in the house until then, but she had to help with the mortgage, and there were no alimony payments for her. During one meeting to separate our assets, she claimed I was hiding money. I told her to let it go, or I would complicate things for her. And surprisingly, she listened. She became very careful around me, picking her words to avoid upsetting me. I suppose this was what being cautious looked like. I let her know that she would get a good amount of money from the house once it was sold, and that settled things. It took a while, but we eventually finished the divorce. I bought a three-bedroom condo for the kids to stay with me. I had them almost every weekend since Jean was busy with her real estate work, especially on Saturdays and Sundays. This worked out for me. I did miss the kids sometimes since I was traveling regularly, especially to the Far East. Overall, life was okay. I smiled to myself. It was hard, but not too bad. After I showed Jean the recording of my talk with Miller, her relationship with Evelyn fell apart. I also shared an edited part of a recording that showed her father talking about his inappropriate actions toward women, and it spread widely. This took on a life of its own, beyond what I had intended. Evelyn left a couple of months later, and I never heard from her again. I caught up with Layla in Chicago. Her real name was Leanne Roxton. She had changed a lot and was doing well in her job. Did you know? I asked her. It was pretty much an open secret, she replied. No one wanted to admit to what had happened. People were scared of what might happen if they spoke up. Why didn't you come forward? I asked, curious. She laughed and shook her head. I really had no idea. Then she added, First, I wasn't personally affected. I reached out to some of the women I knew to see if they would share their stories, and I offered them some money. She looked me in the eye, and I realized I had no right to judge. The second woman I kept in touch with was Rita French. She was very upset when we spoke on the phone and hung up. But when I called the radio station a few days later during the segment with Miller's daughter, it turned out Rita was the first to speak up. She clearly felt it was time to share her story. She took a sip of her soda. I didn't even have to pay her. I contacted her after the radio show, and she mentioned she only vaguely remembered one of the other women. 
But before she could reach out, the Me Too movement started on its own and quickly gained momentum. You could have gained so much from this, I said, feeling sorry for her. She shook her head sadly. By the time they were in legal actions against Miller, I was in Chicago, and honestly I had no idea what was going on. When I looked again, it was all over. She smiled a little sadly, thinking about what could have been. But you gave me a good start, Adam. Thank you. Well, that was it. My actions had reached their ending, and against all odds they had been justified. It was more than I had expected. I kept telling myself I wasn't a bad person. But was I? The Millers had faced a lot of challenges, much like a storyline in a book. I had learned how to deal with my past problems, and things were turning out better than I ever imagined. Financially, I was doing really well. My business was growing, and George was thinking about selling his part so he could retire. Dean and Katie were changing, like many teenagers do. They were focused on school, friends, and sports. Mom and Dad had become more supportive and caring parents. Life went on as it usually does. About four years after the divorce, Jean began dating a man who was a bit older. They lived together for a while, and after a couple of years, they got married. Dean and Katie thought he was a nice person. I was enjoying my freedom, which just meant I wasn't in any serious relationships. I still had some trust issues. After a while, and with my father's support, I started seeing a counselor. I wanted to work through my past and begin to feel better about myself and life. But I knew I still had a long way to go. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.